This is Mrs. Scott Nikki, and I am recording this screencast on Monday evening so that you can listen to it at the beginning of class on Tuesday morning. And I'm really sorry I can't be with you today, but I will explain fully when I am back in class in person on Thursday morning. In the meantime, um, what I have done is I have put together the lesson that I would be giving you, and so um, you'll be getting the same lesson. Um, the only difference will be I won't be in class, um, but I am going to share all kinds of good information with you, and that's going to give you many things to keep you busy today, and we will just pick up uh, where we left off Thursday morning. So thanks for your patience, and I do appreciate if you pay very close attention to this screencast because, like I said, it, it is the lesson I will be giving you, or I would be giving you if I were there in person. So with that, I'm going to jump away from where I am, which is the English for um, Google Classroom page, and I'm going to jump into the agenda, all right, which is posted for you, so you will have access to all this, and I'm just going to walk through the slideshow as though I were there in person, okay? Today's lesson is all about thesis revision, and I'll be sharing with you a presentation that covers a lot of the mistakes that I have observed students make in their senior thesis over the years. I'm also going to share with you a couple tools. Um, you should have those handouts in front of you. Um, they are uh, lavender colored and I think a green colored handout um, on transitions and linking words. All right. Um, by the end of the presentation, you'll have a very good idea of what you should be working on. Uh, we are going to spend two classes, this class, next class, and possibly even a third class, depending upon how things are going, revising. So that's why I haven't established a final draft due date just yet. Okay. Um, I will be going in and checking to see that you have your five pages finished. So um, fear not, that, that piece of um, work is still due today, and I absolutely will be checking it. Okay. So with that, here we go with today's lesson. Remember that last class uh, we talked about writing introductions and conclusions. Today is all about thesis revision. So um, revision is a, uh, is a sort of a process that um, actually is a little bit more involved than I think most of us would like it to be. By the time we get to the end of our papers, it's kind of you know, okay, thank heavens, that thing is over with. I don't ever want to think about it again. But really, um, the work's not quite done yet. Um, revision is often the difference between, say, a B minus paper and an A paper. So it's certainly worth paying attention to. All right. The first thing to the first thing I'd like to remind you about is adding citations. We have talked about this a fair bit, but this is just a reminder because there are a number of you whose drafts that I checked over that are still in need of citations. And the basic rule is if it's in color in your draft, then it needs a citation. Uh, what are you going to cite? Well, you're going to look at your Works Cited page, um, which you can find on your Works Cited draft. and you, fight, you cite what's first in that MLA 9 citation. Um, this slide has an example of a, par of a works cited citation that um, has an author, right? So the author of this citation is Nancy Helmich, and um, the first item is her last name. So that first item is what goes into the parenthetical citation. If I were adding this to my paper, I would open the parentheses, type Helmich, close the parentheses, and then end the sentence. And all of this lives at the end of that purple sentence. Uh, some of you, actually probably most of you, have at least one source that does not include an author, and that's because, say, for example, the editors of a um, of a news organization such as the Washington Times wrote it and did not put their names on it, uh, then 
you the first thing in the citation in the works cited citation is the title and so that's what goes down into the parenthetical citation so the important thing to note with these is that the quotation marks carry over and notice that I have abbreviated this for ease of really the reader because the reader doesn't need to read this whole title every single time um, she or he reads a blurb of information from the source. So abolish the department is really all I need in the text to indicate that this is the original source. Again, notice where the period goes. What does this look like in practice? Well, you can see here an example of a, a very short body paragraph, but nonetheless, a body paragraph. So there are some researched information. There is a space because I'm treating this parenthetical citation like its own word. So I end the sentence. Notice there's no period here after the word vehicles. It's going to go over here. But I have a space. I have parentheses. I have the author's last name. I close the parentheses. I put the period. All right. Um, that's important because once we take the color out, um, you'll see these um, parenthetical citations really kind of vanish into the paper, and they're just that's by design. Remember, MLA is all about prioritizing writing. So at any rate, that's that. Paragraphing. Paragraphing is something we haven't talked about yet, and that's because when you are drafting, I don't want you concerning yourself with how many paragraphs or when do I break the paragraph? Because when you're drafting, everything is all about ideas and it's about finding, you know, you kind of grappling with the research information and figuring out why it's significant and then finding the words to say all that. Paragraphing is thinking about the reader. And the reader is overwhelmed sometimes with what I have termed monster paragraphs. So if you imagine this is me over here down in the right hand corner, this is your small reader, and this is your giant two page paragraph. This is that's too much information, right? So it's a lot to take in. So what do you do? Well, I'll tell you what you do in a second. But first of all, let's talk about what is an appropriate paragraph length. Well, a paragraph probably it is not probably a paragraph is definitely not a page and it is not more than one page all right typically half a page to three quarters of a page works best sometimes it's a little longer sometimes it's a little shorter um, but what you're going to do is look at that large subtopic paragraph that you have and you're going to look for the logical breakpoints like where do you move say from one piece of an evidence to another piece of evidence or for example where do you shift from example A to example B? Or where do you slightly change what you're talking about, right? Look for those smaller changes. Yes, everything is still under that big subtopic heading, but you're looking for the, the much sort of finer distinctions. And then when you find what I'm calling these logical breaks to split apart your big paragraph, you're going to break that into two, or maybe three, or maybe four, if your paragraphs are really big, all right? Um, you're going to use a couple of handouts to help you tie your ideas together, and I'm going to talk about those in a minute, but I'll come back to those, all right? The other thing I want you to do with the body paragraphs is to begin and end every single paragraph with your own ideas. Your words and your ideas um, should control the ideas in the paper, which means when you're looking at your draft, that every paragraph should begin and end with black text. Um, there should be no paragraphs that end with a parenthetical citation. There should be no paragraphs that begin with a sentence that ends with a parenthetical citation. You are in control of the ideas, right? Which means you need to write those sentences. So this is work, but this is what revision is all about. Um, May you break this rule perhaps once or twice if you've got a monster paragraph and you're breaking it into smaller sections. But as for the most part, I want to see you controlling the ideas. Okay, so I'm going to jump back now to transitions. Um, transitions help the reader follow your ideas. When you transition between two similar ideas, you let the reader know, hey, I've got an, a similar example coming up. If you have a contrasting idea, 
you let the reader know, oh, by the way, we're switching gears. If you have a new subtopic, you have to figure out sort of, okay, how does my second subtopic relate to my first subtopic, and then explain that relationship to the reader. So I've given you a couple tools to do this because writing these transition sentences are sometimes um, the trickier, one of the trickier things that you'll do as a writer. So I'm going to jump over now to, and I'm going to show you these documents. So you have these, I believe, in front of you. One is green and one is lavender. Um, and the trick with using them is to notice where, well, first to identify for yourself what are the two things that I'm trying to create a create a transition between are they similar are they contrasting is this a cause and effect type thing um, am I talking now about the conclusion of my paper am I summarizing ideas right if you can identify the relationship then over here on the right hand side is this marvelous tool that gives you a whole bunch of different ways to say it so for similar things they're also in the same way, just as, so on and so forth, all right? If you scroll, if you go to the back of the page, um, similar, okay, comparison, contrast, it's just laid out differently with um, some different words, all right? I'm gonna jump over to the other handout, and I like this one also because it had a lot of different examples on it. In To use this handout, you're gonna look at these um, words that are kind of written vertically along the margins. And so this is what tells you what the relationship is. It might be a relationship of agreement. It might be an example. It might be that causes and effects. It might be a contradiction or in opposition, right? Here's effect and consequences. Um, those are and then everything to the right are all the different types of words, right? Um, words, singular, and phrases, if you'd like to use a phrase. So I find both of these handouts to be very, very helpful um, because they they have different phrases, different words, um, and sometimes you just need to find that the perfect way to say what you want to say, and you're tapped out. Well, these are good handouts to use. Okay, so I'm going to jump back into the presentation now. So transitions are critical. You're going to be looking to incorporate them um, between paragraphs and then between examples within body paragraphs. Um, sometimes um, you may need to craft a sentence, right? If you're going, say, from one subtopic to another subtopic, you may have to figure out how do I, what kind of sentence do I put that is a, a sentence that ties together not just a word or a phrase, right, but a whole sentence that ties together um, these two ideas. So let's just say in paragraph A, I am talking about points that support the view that the new government is very democratic or open-minded. In paragraph B, I, my paragraph is about contradicting views and that say the new government is not terribly democratic. So how am I going to pull those together? Well, I might say, despite previous arguments, there are many reasons to think that the new government is not as democratic as typically believed. And what I've tried to do here with this slide is show you that this, right, the pink stuff relates to the, the paragraph above and the purple stuff in this sentence relates to the paragraph below. And so in combining them and in creating a sentence that combines both of those ideas, you are transitioning between point A and point B. So that's kind of what it looks like. Paragraph B, by the way, this would be your topic sentence, the ones that you already have written. Okay, um, another thing that you really need to look for, and I see this an awful lot in student papers, um, and I certainly would have made this mistake myself, is have I provided all the necessary authority that uh, the reader is going to look for um, when they're thinking critically about the arguments you're making. So for example, let's say you have a whole pile of statistics about climate change. Well, your reader is going to want to know who is, you know, when when did this when was this evidence gathered, right? Because climate change is changing rapidly. So um, how recent is it? Who was the name of the person who did the study? Um, you know, 
if it was a sociological study, how many people were involved in the study, that sort of thing, all right? So if you don't have this information, it needs to go in because I certainly will note it, uh, note its absence. Um, and I hate to say this, but you, you will perhaps have to go back to your notes to find it. And um, I, you know, I hate to say this even more, but it's possible that some of you will need to jump back into the databases um, to look for some of this information. All right, so um, be sure that you've included it. Okay, when we were working on organized notes, um, part two of organized notes, um, that step was for you to add analysis to your researched information. And I suggested you use the signal phrase, this matters because, or this is significant, or this is important, right? There were a handful of them. Um, one of the things that can happen is that that language becomes quite repetitive because we start to rely on it. And all of a sudden you realize, oh my gosh, I've said this is significant 20 times. And then whatever it is that's significant doesn't sound so significant. So one of the things you can do is use the control F feature to search for um, those types of words, all right? You'll know which one you used um, and search for them. And typically all you need to do is remove that signal phrase. So my sentence generally will start just fine if I take out this matters because, and then I just start my sentence right there. This is significant because, take it out, start my sentence right there, all right? And, the, and, and that helped you. These signal phrases are important because they helped you focus on analyzing rather than summarizing, but, um, but they don't belong in your final draft. So use Control F, look for them, take them out. Okay, another thing that uh, happens a lot with high school writers is um, a reliance on um, say first person pronouns and that's because you're you're just in the part of your life where you're developing your ideas and so you're a little hesitant and so therefore in writing that hesitancy comes across with I believe or I think or in my opinion um, that is basically redundant your name is at the top of this paper and so therefore you don't need to say that it's in your opinion I know it's in your opinion your name's at the top of it uh, also, when, when we're writing academically, declarative sentences are stronger than, I believe, declarative sentences are stronger. This phrase here is just unnecessary, and it takes away from the impact of your point. So, take out first person. The only place where it might be acceptable would be the introduction or conclusion of your paper, and then you've included it deliberately because you are using it as a hook to draw the reader in or you're using it in the conclusion to talk about the significance of your topic and, and how it's affected your life, something like that. All right. When you incorporate first person pronouns in academic writing, make sure you have a reason for doing so. If you don't have a reason for doing so, then it doesn't belong. So take those out. Um, while we're on the subject of pronouns, the other one to look for is you. Uh, we as speakers say things like, um, you should pay attention. However, when I say that, it doesn't sound very aggressive. But if it's written that way and you're the person reading it, then you might take offense because you might think, well, I am paying attention. Why are you calling me out? So it comes across as a bit aggressive and the, the tone is not one that you want for your paper. So again, use control F, search for you, also search for your, and, and when you do so, you can generally replace it with the third person pronoun one or uh, another third person pronoun like a person or an individual, and, and then your sentence works just fine. So search for those, take them out as well. Contractions. So here's a little bit of grammar. Contractions are words that have been shortened by omitting a letter. And when we speak, we use these all the time because we compress language so that it flows off of our tongue more easily. However, when we're writing, this 
these contractions, it's, there's, who is, don't, etc. They're informal. And writing, academic writing, should include the full word. So it is, or there is, or who is. If you know you rely on some of these a lot, then search for them. Otherwise, just look for them as you're proofreading. Okay, last but not least, take your time and reread your paper several times, all right? It, this is revision, like I said at the very beginning, is, uh, is actually a significant part of writing. And so, therefore, it's not something to be rushed along. Um, it truly is the difference between, say, a B minus and an A on a paper. Okay, so here we're finally at the slide of what I should be working on today. Ideally, you're at step number six, which is revising your completed thesis draft, okay? If you're not at step number six, then you are doing your best through steps one through five to get yourself to step six. Um, the homework is, of course, to continue revising, and then, like I said, the final copy will probably be due um, not next class, but perhaps the class after that. All right, we have a bit more to get through. I'm going to jump out of this presentation right now and go back to the Google Classroom page. I want to show you just one more thing. All of the resources that um, I have talked about, I have placed here under the Classwork tab, under Senior Thesis, and you'll find um, a new um, item here called thesis revision. It includes the presentation I just gave, the two, the linking words and the transition tools handouts, and then also a thesis proofreading sheet. Now, we're probably, you're not going to get to that today, but that just know that's your one of your next steps. So that's coming. If you're I recommend that you open up this presentation on your own computer and you work your way through it kind of slide by slide. And each time you get to a new slide, set, do what I suggest you do and then move on. That way, for sure, you won't forget anything because I've shared a, a lot of information with you. Um, and you can be methodical about making sure you are kind of dotting your I's and crossing your T's with respect to revision if you go through this um, step by step. So that's why I shared it with you and go ahead and use it that way. Otherwise, that's all I have for you today. And um, I, I appreciate your patience with my absence. Like I said, um, I truly wish I could be there with you. Um, and, but I will be back in class uh, on Thursday and I will get all caught up then. I will be checking your papers digitally and I can do that uh, remotely so I don't have to be there. And um, just use this time wisely, get lots of revision done and lots of work done on your paper, and then um, we'll, we'll pick up where we left off on Thursday. Thanks so much, and I look forward to seeing you soon.